E siamo online, finalmente. Ci voleva una pandemia per farmi arrivare a, a mettere il mio primissimo video su YouTube, però a quanto pare è così. Oggi è il 6 maggio del 2020, siamo nella piena crisi britannica per quanto mi riguarda eh, del Covid-19, siamo chiusi in casa e in questo periodo molti di noi ricercatori, dottorandi, via dicendo, ci stiamo stiamo occupando i nostri giorni e le nostre menti nel fare attività di divulgazione scientifica eh, nei, vari, eh, nei vari media Twitch, uh, Twitch Zoom, uh, Facebook Live, uh, whatever e anch'io mi sono, uh, sono stato diciamo, uh, ingaggiato per, uh, insomma, per, per parlare un po' delle cose che studiamo e per discutere un po' con chiunque sia interessato nel particolar modo sono stato invitato pochi giorni fa dal gruppo di paleontologia su Facebook Paleontology Education tenuto dalla collega uh, Tormina Lepore che è una, una studentessa di dottorato a Berkeley e insieme a Yara Haridi che è un'altra dottoranda uh, a Berlino invece per discutere un'oretta di discussione sulle paleopatologie sia nei dinosauri che in, più in generale sugli animali estinti e, siamo stati tra virgolette intervistati da Tara uh, prima Yara e poi io e abbiamo registrato l'evento che è stato appunto in diretta Zoom Facebook e Qui in questo video trovate eh, la diretta rimontata, c'è stato un momento verso la fine in cui purtroppo eh, Tormina ha perso il collegamento, quindi c'è stata un po' di eh, confusione con, eh, la, con la registrazione con la diretta e ho, adesso vedo se riesco a mettere un po' a posto. Purtroppo non riesco a mettere ancora i sottotitoli, quindi vi beccate il video in inglese. E vediamo se dopo questo video riesco a creare qualcosa di più, più in italiano. E, boh, Vedete, intanto iniziamo con calma con il primissimo video. E quindi 3, 2, 1, via con la live. Sorry, that's the beginning okay. of the recording. Um, that's all good. So, yeah, so this is one of the prototypes that we're uh, thinking of building as a science communication tool, because one of the best ways to really teach someone about um, past life is to actually get them to interact with it in a face-to-face -face or face-to-tooth uh, manner. So this is something that we're proposing. And then the other picture is uh, me holding a pathological set of antlers. Um, this is something I like to do at my own museum, uh, bring out weird specimens and get people to actually specimens and understand why they're so weird or what's the story behind them. Um, so this is kind of my two big methods of Uh, science communication as well as social media. <clears throat> uh, obviously working with uh, paleontological specimens, I don't really discriminate between the really small and the really big, uh, as long as it's bone, as long as it had some sort of pathology, as long as it can actually tell us a biological story, uh, I'm super interested regardless. So you'll see me talking about a variety of animals. Um, I don't work on any special Uh, I would work a, bit, a little bit on everything. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction, which I'm sure um, Filippo will go through again with you if you didn't get it, or if you're joining a little bit later, so don't worry too much if you miss any of this. Uh, but basically, one of my side um, passions is paleopathology because, well, let's just start with what is paleopathology. So paleopathology is basically the study of ancient diseases, and that's the overarching theme. Anything that Um, is ancient or is in a fossil and has some sort of disease, injury, or any malady, it's, it's basically a paleopathology. So some of our earliest animals on, in humanity actually uh, come from some hominid. So this is an example of an osteosarcoma, which is bone cancer, um, and it's about uh, 1.8 million years old. And on the other side, you have 240 million year old osteosarcoma. So that's again, both bone cancer, but this is in a stem turtle. So you can actually see from the external appearance how similar some of these bumpy, lumpy bones uh, can be. And that's what we're gonna really talk about today. Uh, a lot of bumpy bones. So there's uh, a bunch of different kinds of pathologies and they kind of fall under this umbrella 
of what type they are, what caused them, and what the cells and bone is actually doing. So traumatic pathology is the most common, um, and it basically means the animal got injured. So you can tell usually because the two bones are not meeting, uh, there's a callus around them. Uh, there's other ways to tell, but this is kind of like your quintessential, your very like obvious traumatic pathology. It's a broken bone that's healed, at least to some extent. There's developmental pathology, so basically the bones grew wrong or the animal had some sort of abnormality as it was growing. <clears throat> and these can take all kinds of shapes and they're usually not this obvious, but this is just for uh, explanation effect. There's additive pathology, so anything that grows on top or is an extra amount of tissue that probably shouldn't be there, uh, or it can happen through age. There's erosive pathology, so like if bone is being taken away where it should be and it isn't anymore. And there's neoplasms, which is a different type of tissue uh, either growing in an area it shouldn't or a tissue changing from one type to another. And the cancer actually falls under the law. So now that you know there's general types, that's basically our first step to diagnosing a fossil. So obviously one of the very first ones is, well, how do you know a fossil is sick? You know, you're, you don't walk by a skeleton and it doesn't sneeze. So how do you know it's sick? And the most obvious answer is comparative osteology. Basically, look at it. And you look at the different kinds of bones. So sometimes it's super obvious. Like here, this is a tail of a sauropodomorph. So it came for the super long neck, dinosaur nose. They're kind of uh, looked like this. And this is a, a segment of one of them. And how annoyed and upset the bone kind of looks. It's all bumpy and lumpy. And the way it's contacting each other, it just doesn't look happy. And it's obviously logical. So this is pathological confusion. There. Um, other times, again, it's, it's quite obvious. So this is an, um, an Alice worm mount from, I think, the LACM. And sometimes, again, it's super obvious, even so obvious that actually pretty much down there, you can tell it was a traumatic pathology of some kind. And definitely this rib was broken at some point, and then either it was trying to heal or there was a second infection, but it was definitely traumatic at the beginning. So you get that extra growth on the outside. So I want everybody, whenever they go and look at skeletons in the museums, now to like super and just like, weird bumps because they actually tell you a full story of what the animal's life was like who it like bumped if it fell off something if it broke its leg if it has arthritis it got old like it tells more of the animal's life and that's one of my favorite parts about paleopathology uh, other times you get like developmental so I've never talked about something grows wrong so these are actually two uh, or several fused vertebrae but they just didn't segment properly, they didn't separate properly while the animal was developing, and they're quite common in amphibians, or um, ancient amphibians. So here you can see that there's actually multiple segments, but it's all blocked, so it doesn't look all interesting until you know what you're looking for. And then you can actually tell, oh, it's actually a developmental abnormality, and the animal just didn't develop properly. Uh, and these can be signs for a bunch of things like, abnormal temperatures during development um, or toxicity in the water. At least this is with modern amphibians. We can't so much tell um, with the ancient amphibians what exactly happened. Um, so how do you die now? If it's super obvious on the outside, how can you actually tell uh, what it is? So one of my favorite ways, because I'm a hypothesis at me, is I study options. So I cut up fossils really, really thin uh, and I look at the cell structures and the tissue structure. And so obviously I'm gonna tell you, cut up your fossils. But most curators don't really like to hear that. Most people who collect fossils don't really like to hear that. That's not their fate. They don't want you just to, you know, take their favorite fossil and chop it up and tell them it's data enhancement, but yeah. So I always say um, histology is probably your best way to get an answer of what it closely was. But again, like I said, it's um, not always possible. So second best, but also is CT scanning. So the same thing as what your doctor would do for you. Um, they would basically put you in an x-ray and it's the same thing, but in 3D. Um, so here, 
externally, you can't really tell what's happening in the bone. This is of an ice age frog. Uh, but once you actually CT scan it, you can tell it was a traumatic pathology. It broke its leg, uh, its leg bone and there's a big callus around it. And how I can tell is because you can see the two separate parts with all the spongy bone all around it, just keeping the two sides stable until the inside can heal and remodel. So that's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, CT scanning uh, is now usually everyone's go-to. Uh, most of these are micro CT scans because it's for small specimens, so like I showed you earlier, I sometimes work on really, really small stuff. Uh, this is a little bit more problematic for big dinosaurs. Um, I'll let Filippo talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but yeah, so CT scans, x-rays, basically the same stuff that your doctors would use, histology and CT, we do with fossils and rocks. And what do we look for? So, okay, now, great, you have a bunch of x-rays and a bunch of CTs. What are you actually leaning on? What are you trying to understand? How do you diagnose this from a bumpy, lumpy bone to what we think it actually is and why does it matter? Uh, so this is, again, that uh, osteosarcoma, but obviously we didn't know that at the beginning. So we CT scanned it. We could tell there was no evidence of resorption. So remember when I showed you there was erosive pathologies? There wasn't any evidence of that. There wasn't any evidence that something came in and took away bone. There was no evidence of healing, like that um, Ice Age frog I showed. There was no evidence of infection. There was no bite marks. So a lot of it is actually just taking away what there isn't and then actually reducing it to what there is. So there's a large growth. The filigree appearance is actually a medical term for this weird like spiny look that bone gets when it's growing in a certain way. And there's no space between the two. And this is when we lean on um, research a lot because this is all we have really when it comes to soft tissue. So we take a lot of uh, the symptoms from medical research and we kind of try to apply it with the understanding that these ancient animals didn't grow the same way humans do. And yeah, so sometimes that's what we do. We uh, compare healthy bones and healthy bones. So these are two fused vertebrae. They don't look very happy. The one before it, this one is the normal one uh, from a slightly different part in the tail of a varanopid. So that's a, um, an early Permian reptile-like thing. We don't exactly know what they are, but um, these, these are their vertebrae. And yeah, so this is a pathological one. This is what it looks like on the outside. That, we can't really tell too much what's happening. Uh, until we CT'd it, you can tell the bone looks angry, it looks upset. On the inside, it looks like um, it's eroding in certain areas and building in others, and the two don't really go together in a normal bone growth way. So what that means is there's actually a disconnect between how the bone should grow and the way it is growing. And this leads us to know that it's a type of metabolic disease, which is really cool because now we know that pathologies like this can help us reveal this black box that we can't get from, from fossils. Basically, fossils, when, when the animal grows properly, we can't tell what the cells were doing. But when it grows improperly, it actually gives us almost like a non-model, like um, when something goes wrong, it's the only time you can actually figure out how it worked in the first place. So this is my favorite thing about uh, paleopathologies, this is actually giving us a window into how these animals worked on a cellular level. So this is one of the reasons that um, I basically, I'm trying to direct more of my PhD into this because I just think it's so interesting uh, how much we can know about disease and how much we can know about these animals' um, growth and life cycles. So yeah, thank you so much for uh, your input and I'm sure Filippo will love to expand on a lot of that. Yeah, that was awesome, Yara. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, folks, if you have questions, um, I don't see any in the chats or in the Facebook Live just now, but if you do, um, we're gonna hold them until the last 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, and we're gonna move on to Filippo's talk, but I think the two talks will kind of knit together nicely. And um, yeah, Yara, this is fascinating stuff. I really love the visuals and the, the way that you can look at bones without necessarily having to slice them. Um, just, yeah, super cool. <laughs> All right, Filippo, are you ready to come on up to the plate? 
watch uh, what do I need to speak? Yeah, I said already everything. <laughs> that was a, that, no, seriously, that was a beautiful presentation. Seriously, uh, I, I speak a little more about big bones, I think. So, share it. Yep. Do you see? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yep. Okay, can I go? Yeah, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. I'm very proud uh, and very honored to speak uh, today with, to you uh, in presence of one of the two best women in paleontology right now. Seriously, guy, if you, especially if you are uh, women that are interested in science, these two girls are both that you should contact to have any kind of advice or whatever, because they are really great in what they are doing, especially for uh, um, scientific outreach. Uh, speaking about myself, uh, as uh, Tara said uh, brilliantly already, I'm a PhD student in uh, Northern Ireland, in Belfast, and uh, uh, my project uh, falls within what we are speaking about, uh, um, the paleopathology, but uh, I will look at a much larger bones uh, um, in, in scale compared to the very tiny yet very beautiful bones of, that Yara showed you. Um, before the starting my PhD, I did my bachelor in science in uh, Bologna, the University of Bologna, and then I did my master in uh, Germany, uh, working with some uh, big, very big dinosaurs. I'm also an associate researcher with the Sociedad de Historia Natural in Portugal, and sometimes I also um, do some uh, activity, uh, outreach activity as a STEM ambassador. My first, ever, my first ever research that kind of introduced me in the world of ornithopods, uh, that are the dinosaurs that I'm studying right now, uh, is, was the um, thesis that I did in Bologna that ended up as a paper published in PRJ about uh, one of the most beautiful dinosaurs ever and yet one of the most uh, enigmatic. Now that we also have the new beautiful paper about Spinosaur, we are, everybody are very excited about these sailed, sailed back dinosaurs. Well, Oranosaur is one of them. Uh, he didn't live with Spinosaur. It was, uh, if I remember correctly, it was a little older than Spinosaur, uh, but he presented a similar structure, the sail in, in the back. Uh, we still don't know exactly what it was for, but uh, I hope uh, we will uh, study more this feature in the future. Right now I have some ideas how to continue my, uh, my career after my PhD and kind of involve this animal, but we will see. Then I moved in Germany, where uh, together with Martin Sa Professor Martin Sander and uh, Marcus Lamberts, we studied the histology. So again, speaking about slicing uh, uh, dinosaur bones, as Yara was saying, uh, we cut, uh, think about taking a, a salami and just slice it. Uh, we sliced the big vertebra of long neck dinosaurs, such as sauro um, Diplodocus and other uh, sauropods, to study the inner structure of uh, the pneumatization. So you know that dinosaurs were very big, especially some of them were very big, and the long neck dinosaurs were the biggest and they were able to reach such structures, such enormous size for several reasons. And one of the most important was the fact that their body was completely full of air. Their lungs uh, weren't similar to ours, but they were more similar to birds. They were uh, attached to the uh, axial skeleton uh, and each lung presented a series of air sac. Think about an air balloon that just uh, uh, spread over the body of the animal and uh, entered inside each bone, so like the vertebra, uh, basically making a, a sauropod as a zeppelin with legs. I, I like to call them that in that way. Um, what I was interested to check was, uh, was how this air sac inside the bones were attaching, if they were attaching to the inner side of the bone, or if they were just lying over them. And with histology, which is an extremely powerful tool to do this stuff, we uh, define the presence of uh, some very, very fine fibers that are very uh, difficult to find, to, to see. But uh, when you are able to see them, they, are, um, they appear extremely in an extremely wide number. 
So our hypothesis is that these fibers were kind of connecting the air sac to the uh, bone uh, uh, wall, but there are still a lot of things to do, but it was a very interesting thing to, to do. And the next one was the paper that kind of uh, introduced me into the, um, into the world of pathology. Uh, back in 2012, if I remember correctly, a uh, paleontologist from Milan, Simona Maganuco, asked me if I was uh, um, interested to study uh, an uh, adrosaur skeleton. And of course I was. It was like a Christmas morning for me. And we started to study. And this dinosaur called Griposaur, you can see here in this very nice picture by Marco Di Tore, an Italian paleo artist. Uh, this duck billed dinosaur was, uh, was discovered in Canada, in Alberta, a beautiful area with thousands, thousands of dinosaur bones and hundreds of other uh, material. And this dinosaur was found there in 1922, yes. It arrived in Milan in the 50s and then it was left there in, the, in Milan. A cast is exhibited in the museum, whereas the original is kept in the archive. And two papers were made out of it. And we made a, a newer one because the last one was like in the 70s. So we needed to do a, um, an updated version of the paper. And while studying this stuff, we recognized that this dinosaur presented at least three uh, pathological conditions. The first bone, sorry, the picture is a little small. Uh, the first bone is a predentary. Predentary is a typical bone for this dinosaur that is in front of the lower jaw to make the beak. And inside, in, in, the, in the central part of this bone, there was a huge cavity. This cavity was not related to any artificial work. Maybe some, uh, maybe some person just snapped the hammer on it. No, this was a natural feature, uh, pathological in nature, because there are no other way to explain this stuff. And again, we have a look at other other sort of bone like that, and no one presented such such structure. Uh, the bone in the middle is a dorsal vertebra that is uh, completely fused to its uh, rib, and the rib also in, enlarged its uh, bone tissue to form like a shield. And we think that this, uh, this was uh, uh, due to a lateral bump from another animal, which I, I show you a picture later. So you, start to you, you can start to think that pathology can give us much more information on the lifestyle and the and the life of the individual that is in front of us uh, 70 million of years after his death. And the last one is two fused uh, caudal vertebra from the middle region of the tail. And I'm still not sure what this is. Uh, we need to work a little more on this because there, are, there can be actually two to three different diagnoses for this and we need uh, uh, more study. What it was cool is that last summer I was exactly in the same spot where in 1922 this animal was discovered. So you see this is on the, on the, on the right. This is an historical picture taken during those years. Below there is another picture took in 2006. And here I am in the exactly same spot in 2019. And you can see that the geology and the structure of the sediments around didn't really change through the time. And this is incredible in the in that era because uh, uh, people there are able to um, to find uh, old quarries that have been completely lost uh, during the years. Uh, a bit of my activ uh, scientific activities. So uh, sometimes I speak to universities. This is me uh, at the university in, in Germany, in Bonn, last December. I love to speak about dinosaurs to children. I'm usually invited here in, in Northern Ireland to speak to primary schools and the children, of course, they are the best audience ever because they are so smart. Uh, they can have some of the best questions ever that you will never ever expect from them. And you're like, wow, I never thought about that. And this is really fun. I usually participate also in uh, field work. This is in Portugal, but I also dug up in uh, uh, in Germany, in America, in Canada, and all around Europe. Uh, being in Northern Ireland is also fine because right now I am the only paleontologist here in Northern Ireland. So when television needs, they usually call for me. This is very cool. 
uh, this was for the DP presentation in Belfast when uh, the Diplodocus from London was exhibited here at the, universe, at the museum in Belfast. And here, uh, actually, the, I want to do a shout out to my fellow artist colleague. So from, after a meeting in Bernissart in uh, Brussels last year in Belgium, uh, Joshua Nuppe, Oliver Demuth, Troco and Fabio Manucci and, uh, and me uh, we basically uh, join our force together to start to make uh, uh, a new reality for European uh, pillow art because we really think that pillow art is uh, a, a, key, a key tool for uh, spreading the word of dinosaur and other prehistoric creatures. So if you're interested in our project, uh, you can go to Twitter and follow us. So speaking about my project, now finally we speak about pathologies. So uh, you see that Yara uh, already showed you that pathologies uh, arrived in uh, different forms. That can be trauma, that can be infection, that can be um, tumors, that can be related to development disorders, dietary disorders, uh, or who knows what other stuff, because sometimes we really don't know what we have in front of our eyes. And so, uh, and Yara showed us different techniques to study it, histology and CT scans. In my project, uh, I use, of course, histology and CT scans, but just for some, some of them, because right now I'm studying pathologies in the clade of Ornithopoda, so the duck-billed dinosaur, from small forms like a dryosaur to iguanodon to the famous Parasaurolophus, that you can see here on the upper right. But what I want to see is that how I want to check how we can use pathologies as a whole to describe the biology of, of a specific family. Family, let's call it, it's a clade, but let's say family. Uh, so when I study pathology in uh, uh, more primitive forms, so up to the tree to go to the bigger and the more evolved species like adrosaurs, how the pathological rates change between uh, smaller forms and the uh, larger forms. How pathological, uh, how pathological rates change if you take adrosaurs from, for example, North America and from Russia when they were separated, living from in different environments uh, and uh, being exposed to different kinds of, of external stimuli. Uh, and also, once we have a huge data set of pathologies for one family, especially for one specific lady, in this case, adrosaurids, what was the impact of his injuries in their lifestyle? So for example, here you can see this famous bone. This is the lower jaw of Stephanosaurus, that is a nomen dubium, yeah, or nudum dubium, I think. Uh, and you can see in the middle, there is a big cavity uh, that is known due to um, taphonomy, so the, prox the process of fossilization, but it was, uh, it was a natural, uh, it has a natural cause, uh, some pathology with i'm thinking about some infections so think about this animal that bite uh, some some uh, tree some leaf something that left a little scar in his mouth and the bacteria started to erode completely the mouth of the animal um leaving a, a, a very deep cavity inside and so this animal you would, he would have appeared with a huge scar on the side and i think that is pretty cool because Pathology can really give you the idea of how an animal would look like. Exactly like the Parasaurolophus, this is the very nice skeleton in Toronto that is the holotype of the species. That means the first animal described to make the species. And actually this animal is full of pathology. It's very cool because it showed that this animal was able to endure a lot of uh, unlucky event in its life. Uh, we are going to submit the paper very soon, so uh, I'm very excited to show you what we discover in this in this animal because Parasaurolophus is also one of my best, one of my favorite dinosaurs. But uh, right now, this is one of the coolest individual uh, in the entire dinosaur record. Here, this is a uh, Chu Ischia, so is the butt of the. You are looking at the butt of the of the dinosaur. And you can see that the left one is quite cool, it's quite okay, but when you go to the right one, it's completely overturned to the side with a huge bump here. And to think about, uh, we don't know how this happened. Probably the animal just uh, collapsed on the ground, maybe after a fall, and it just uh, bumped his butt on the ground. Sorry for this, but this is exactly what happened. Uh, but the animal survived because uh, we don't see any kind of, of infection. We don't see any kind of, 
of a related tumor or whatever, the animal was going to heal and therefore survive. Maybe a, a carnivore just arrived in that moment and kill him biting his neck. We don't know that. We just know that this dinosaur was able to survive a very big injury. And speaking about the griposaur that I presented you before, as I told you, we see that there is a dorsal vertebra fused with the, um, with the, uh, with the rib. And you see this, uh, this kind of pathology in a lot of specimen. So it's a recurrent pathology that you find in this specific uh, family of dinosaur. And what we um, suggested in our paper is that uh, hadrosaurs were fighting for territory, mating, uh, whatever, uh, like a giraffe do now by bump bumping their side on each other since they lack uh, horns and spikes. Uh, perhaps, um, perhaps this was the way they were fighting because uh, we have some pathologies, actually a lot of pathology that uh, suggest this. And this is uh, a, a very brief uh, uh, spoiler of my research. So basically these are the three uh, dinosaurs that I'm gonna uh, uh, compare for pathologies. And we have uh, some trends in pathology. So we see some pathology that are not present in the lower form. And the more we, we move towards the end of the tree of this dinosaur, this, the evolutionary tree, of this dinosaur, the number of pathologies just increase in that part of the body. So we can, we can try to reconstruct also the, the tempo and mode of evolution because pathology actually had an impact, perhaps had an impact on the evolution of the different body part of these animals. And I think this is the coolest part, the coolest part of our field because uh, in when you see a skeleton that has no pathologies at all, you look at it in a very external point of view. To, to you, it's just a, a mythical creature, like a drago, because it looks perfect. But when you spot a pathology, like an infection, you kind of feel bad for the animal and in because he suffered. And in that feeling of, of shared suffering, you are uh, giving life to the animal. The, the dinosaur is not anymore just a bunch of old bones uh, glued together by some iron bar, but the animal take flesh, take blood, take nerves, and it becomes alive in front of you. And I think this is very the, the most interesting part, the most uh, uh, fascinating part of our job. Here, uh, some of my contacts, you can find me on uh, Instagram. I use Instagram a lot for uh, uh, dinosaur, um, sci scientific dinosaur outreach, or you can email me or follow me on Twitter. So I'm here if you have any questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Yara and Tara for the space and may the fourth be with you. Wow, Filippo, that was amazing. And I really um, just want to give a shout out to you and Yara both because, you know, you gave a shout out to us and, and it really is an honor for, for all of us here to get together and, and for me to be able to hear what you guys are up to. And I hope everyone in the audience got something out of both of these talks. And this is just fascinating work, both of you. So Thank you so much for your time and for sharing. There's some clapping and even louder clapping happening happening in the in the in the in the chat. I see somebody said, and also with you, Filippo. <laughs> so yes, may the fourth be with you all. Um, <laughs> so there are a couple of questions. Let's see. I also really like um, Filippo what you just said about the whole idea of of kind of building like compassion for an animal that's long since died and and getting a sense of wow this is a living a living creature that's really cool um, yeah that's a really good uh, presentation Filippo and i have actually like known each other quite a bit but i actually don't we've never gotten to talk about what we no. share and so this is like you guys are seeing a first meeting here definitely not the last but but it was amazing it was a really good um thank yeah. you actually yeah we know for a lot of uh, for a lot of time and uh, uh, I know, yeah, the first time I know of Yara, I think it was for one of your paper. So it was, uh, it was a very cool way to, to meet you, but uh, we have so much to, to work together on this because mm -hmm. there, there is so many things to do in, in paleopathology. It's just an, such a new field that just in the last, what, 10, five years, it's been yeah. resurrected. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. 
So basically what we're trying to say is if you guys are at a museum and you see bumps and lumps, like take a picture, tag us on like social media. Seriously, a lot of times people just don't notice them or a lot of these skeletons go up like way, way long ago and nobody cared about these like bumps and lumps. So if you see something cool or weird, like totally tag us, point it out to us. We love it. There's also a Facebook group, like come post that stuff. We'll die. We'll try to diagnose it for you. That'll be fun. Actually, uh, I, have a, uh, I have a fun story about that. Uh, when I was in Toronto uh, years ago for my, um, for my uh, journey to collect data, uh, I write to the museum and I ask the curator, so how many pathologies do you have on other source? And he answered me, I don't know. I don't think <laughs> that, ma that many. And if after they don't say like 300, you know they didn't look. Like, it's no, just exactly. And after I just other source so no no any other animals after one week i came back to him and said so filippo how much right now 100 <laughs> what yeah. so every time you go to a museum you look at a skeleton and you say ah there's a pathology and people are like what we have that skeleton for 100 years and we never noticed that yeah it's so true no it's so I, I walk through like different museums with curators and like hey did you know you're like Nothosaur over there has like a broken rib, like three of them in a row. Like that thing must have taken a hit. They're like, no, it's not on the sign. We don't know this. Like it's just, you know, obviously they're dealing with a lot of things all at the same time. And unless you're like looking for it, you kind of just scan right over. But it tells such a cool story. Because not only is the animal like hurt, but like you said, Filippo, like it survived, right? So like that whole history of the survival is written in the bones, which is like my favorite. Yeah, I really love that, you know, folks who are watching this now or who watch this at a later time, like can take away from this a little piece of what it is to do science, which we all do all the time, making observations and asking questions about the natural world. But this is like something that it's almost like a little miniature citizen science initiative where you're looking at museum exhibits in a new way and skeletons in a new way, which is sort of like a little secret superpower. <laughs> So we have a couple of questions. Um, let's see. Uh, one of them here says, a question uh, for either Yara or Filippo. Do tooth bite marks count as traumatic pathology? And are there ways you can clearly tell a tooth is bitten into bone versus a diagenetic association or something else impacting it from CT data? Filippo, you want to take this or should I? Yeah, uh, or we can combine uh, things. Uh, so that was actually um, one of the first points that my supervisors asked me to clarify uh, for my research, because yeah, you can find a lot of tooth marks on uh, uh, bones, but those tooth marks are usually left by predators to, um, to a corpse, a dead animal. And we don't count them as pathologies because actually by definition, a uh, fossilized pathology is any kind of problem that the animal endured and survived. If there is a tooth mark that left uh, resorption signs like infection, or you can see some bubbling or, or on the bone all around, or maybe, or maybe a callus uh, next or below this tooth mark, that counts as a pathology. If you have a plain, uh, a plain uh, bone and just a ridge on it with a fr we call them fresh fracture so like a, a sharp ridge on the margins no that doesn't count as pathology that's, that counts as taphonomy and the fight between pathology and taphonomy is actually exactly like here it's like the the uh, the dark side and the light side they are always fighting each other and you never know which one we have to go on <laughs> I like yeah. that. <laughs> I mean, that's actually pretty good. <laughs> it's so true because, um, yeah, so, so just to add to, to Filippo's really good explanation, um, yeah, we all, you all have to be aware of taphonomy, right? So you, uh, a break in the bone doesn't mean that the animal actually broke its bone during life, but if it has any healing marks, then you know that it actually broke it during life and at least survived some amount after. So let's apply that to bite marks, which was the initial question. So people a lot of times ask me, can you tell like this animal like had a killer bite mark? Like that's the bite mark that like killed it at that moment. And the problem is if that bite mark killed that animal, it probably never had any chance to heal at all. 
So what it would look to us, it would look to us like probably scavenging. Uh, unless you can somewhat tell from a perfect position that it was like, you know, near an important like uh, organ or something. But even then, like most, like 99% of the time, you're going to say it's taphonomic it ha or, or it's scavenging. It's something that happened after the animal died because we don't have, like Filippo said, that evidence of healing. So we can't call it that it happened during the animal's lifetime. So yes, we can. We totally have bite marks. We have healed bite marks. Uh, I think, Filippo, there's that one specimen that has uh, a tooth embedded, right? Yeah, there is. There are, that. Yeah, there is a, a specimen. Uh, I don't know where it is now, right now because I saw it uh, uh, at the Smith's, no, at the American Natural History Museum of New York uh, when I was there in October for the Tyrannosaur exhibition. But it's a, an itinerary exhibition, so I don't know if it's still in New York or what. Uh, there is a, a two uh, middle caudal uh, middle caudal of adrosaurs, so it's also into my uh, project. Uh, where uh, basically the two centra, so the two body of the vertebra, are completely distorted by an overgrowth of reactive bone, uh, infective bone, uh, and the palma, yeah, was the palma et al that made a CT scan of the of the block. And they found a tooth embed within, and it looks like a tyrannosaur tooth. So you have to imagine this tyrannosaur that chased the adrosaur, it bites below, so basically this is the tail, it bites below the tail. Probably, I don't know, the adrosaur was uh, stronger, was bigger, it slapped with the tail, or maybe just ran faster. It was able to uh, run away from the bite. But in the movement, the Tyrannosaur tooth just uh, um, detached from the maxilla or dentary, I don't know, and it, it remained inside of the body. And, that, uh, and there, the, the immune system just started to react against the bacteria that usually is present in a, a predator mouse. And that created that huge um, mass of very nasty thing that fossilized afterward. Yeah, actually, I just thought, I remembered another example. Well, sorry, Tara, I know that you're probably holding on to another question. But, yeah, um, it's all good. Keep going. But one other really good example uh, is uh, the face-biting mosasaur, right? Yep. There's that one mosasaur that has in the jaw, like, it's basically like this crazy looking like ex excavation, like almost like there was a cyst in it that surrounded um, a tooth. And there was a tooth, I think, of, a, of another mosasaur in there, right? Or was it a shark? I, I think it was another mosasaur. There I was, was another a... mosasaur because I think it linked back to their like possible face biting behavior because they have all kinds of pathologies on their face. So sometimes you're really lucky and you get like beautiful direct evidence of behavior like that. And it's like the holy grail of uh, paleopathology, yeah. I think. You guys are giving all of us some good things to try and find to read. <laughs> if we just search oh, for we, like fossil we, we bite can, marks. We, uh, we could speak about this stuff for hours. I know, yeah, one hour is not long enough. Um, so there's another question here. Uh, okay, so what differences would you expect from a pathological condition with respect to some allometric growth? So um, related to accumulation of genetic mutations, or for example, um, you know, you might see bone or teeth growth that looks fine, but then as the animal grows, like maybe it's, is it, is it not in the place where you might expect to find a certain bone or a certain tooth, um, just due to like the growth of that individual bone? That's, that's that, that term allometric growth for those who might not know. It's like when a, like a baby has different proportions of the skeleton than the adult. So you might see, for example, like a dog puppy will have different proportions of this of the skeleton than a dog adult in some cases. But a cat or a lizard maybe might look like a tiny version of an adult as a baby. That that would not be right. That's that's isometric I, growth. Yeah. I think uh, Yara is the I think is the best one to answer. <laughs> to this. Um, I think there those are actually like several separate questions. So, so have we found a pathology that can affect allometric growth? That's difficult because, at least for me, most of the pathologies I find are um, isolated elements. So like you have one limb or one piece or whatever. So like say you have a really like broken femur or something. Can I tell that it affected the other femur? 
for me, most of my specimens, that's not really the case because I usually don't have the other femur. Um, sometimes I think, I think there's a paper that just came out about something along these lines where there's an injury that affects the other limb, but I'm, uh, yep. right? I haven't gotten to it yet, but um, it's quite rare because again, usually you don't find like a beautiful, perfect skeleton. And even if you do, people don't really want you to cut both limbs because that's kind of really how you're going to figure out like if there's a lot of stretch growth in a, um, unless you're going to do some measurements. Um, as for finding tissues where they shouldn't be, um, that would be closer to neoplasms and things like cancer. So like um, a really good example is actually in, again, a hadrosaur because they're covered in all kinds of pathologies. There is an ameloblastoma. What that means is it's basically a tumor that's made of enamel. And that's in a hadrosaur, and that's having tissue grow in a place that it shouldn't, or too much of a tissue grow in a place that it shouldn't. Um, but they're two separate things, I think, uh, in this case. Bernie Sarp, uh, so the famous iguanodon. <laughs> the famous 30 iguanodon skeletons. And the problem is those skeletons suffer a lot from uh, uh, oxidation of, of pyrite. And the pyrite uh, cover completely the bone, making uh, bubbles and uh, patches of bone that kinda, that kinda, that are kind of similar to like a reaction, infection reaction, but they are not infection reaction, they are taphonomy. But some of the time it's very difficult to distinguish two of them. So uh, sometimes I don't know if I'm looking at a pathology or a taphonomy because, I, or I had to cut out, cut it out or CT scan, but. But even your CT scans usually don't get like the resolution you want for that kind of stuff. Uh, in case anyone's wondering, these are usually called like pseudo pathologies, things that look like pathologies, but aren't basically and they make our lives hell um but yeah like like Filippo said best way is you scan it you kind of look for continuity so like okay is the bone growing along this bump so you know that the bump is real or whatever but sometimes it's really really difficult because that means you have to get really high resolution or you have to cut it which people don't want you to <laughs> so it's hard uh, we finished the question in the chat of Zoom. I don't know if, if in Facebook we have something, but I don't have the Facebook. Yeah. Hi, hi, guys. Sorry, my computer actually shut down on me. Like, it just decided to stop. So I'm, I'm back. Um, the only questions that I, I unfortunately can't see the rest of the chat, um, but somebody here asks um, signs of healing. It's kind of more of general comment. Signs of healing in the bone should tell if it's taphonomic or not. And then in the Facebook, uh, Facebook live chat, um, there was a question about, there's a question. It was more general, like how many dinosaurs have been found, I think was the question. So I don't know if any of us know the answer to that. <laughs> I don't, I don't even know, like, species, let alone, like, I'm more than you think, less than you fear. Yeah, yeah, and actually, <laughs> the, the actual question was, how often are new dinosaurs discovered? So... Too often. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> Except on it is, <laughs> Um. Yeah, it, it depends. Yeah, all the time. Literally all the time, I think. Uh, yeah, I think we're living through, like, the golden age of paleontology because we have the best technology we've ever had. We have some of the most amazing people working on stuff all over the world. Uh, and we know more about taxonomy than ever before. So, yeah. And I don't know if, if I missed this because of my computer issue. And thank you guys for rolling with this as I, I could see you on my phone and I'm like, okay, <laughs> good. They're still going. Um, but uh, yeah, just in the last minute or so, um, do you guys have any thoughts or advice for folks watching who may be interested in going into science, going into paleontology? You know, it, it doesn't have to be a single sound bite. It's a, it can often be a big conversation. But um, just anything, anything you'd like the audience to know about entering paleo as a field or science in general as a field? First, ladies first. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say the one of the things that made me really fall in love with the paleo is that I can ask big questions 
but better than that, I can actually use whatever methods I want. So for example, if you like paleontology, but you're really good at chemistry, you can come into paleontology with chemistry. If you really like paleo as a side thing, maybe, but you're really into medicine, you can come and do this. Um, if you like paleo, but your thing is physics, like there's so, like there's so many subfields and they're all applicable to some of these big questions and we need more people with that kind of variety. Um, so I wouldn't have that stop you. Uh, also, of course, like a uh, shout out to like social sciences, like people who are interested in like all kinds of things. That's all actually quite applicable to paleontology. Uh, more so than ever before. So if you're doing like, um, what's it called, a dual major, like if you're majoring in multiple things, maybe consider paleontology as like the thing that bridges both those gaps, because it really, really can. I mean, I came from a background where I was going to medical, I was like planning on going to medical school. Like that wasn't, that's it. Like I was focused. I hadn't taken a single evolution class. I hadn't taken a single paleontology class. Like, and, and it's not impossible to catch up. There's a lot of really cool people in this, like, sphere and there's a lot of resources so you can you can honestly come in with any background um and don't get let that discourage you that your like favorite thing is physics it's totally applicable yeah that's really great advice and i'll just jump onto that and say that if i want to hear from you filippo too um but real quickly um like i i know i have a friend who came into this field with an english degree you know uh if you take a job in between you know, going back to school, like that's awesome too. Um, and it can only ultimately help you, you know, really determine what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Filippo, um, I know we're just a couple minutes over, but yeah. really want to hear uh, your thoughts. The follow, follow up what Yara just said, uh, my advice is that you should, you should be open to everything. So be, be curious about uh, what surrounds you, uh, what's in nature. Uh, in any kind of aspect, so medical, biological, physical, chemical, whatever. And uh, okay, uh, Yara gave you the professional advice, a very good one. What I can advise you is to, is to cultivate your inner child. Be, uh, be impressed by things every time. Every time you go to a museum, uh, uh, like thanks to my job, I traveled to a lot of museums uh, in the last two years. And at a certain point, you see always the same stuff because may, may, maybe it's the same, same cast of skeleton that is put in different museum. But every time for me, it's just the first time. So I'm always inspired by the Diplodocus. And you see the Diplodocus in at least 20 different museums. But for 20 times, you, you, for 20 times, you feel like a child watching a very giant animal. So cultivate that inner child, be impressed and be curious about the nature. And uh, if you want to enter paleontology, you just need to be extremely sure because uh, apart from the romantic point of view, it's a very difficult field and uh, uh, it's kind of harsh. It's a wonderful field, but it's also harsh. So uh, you need to be extremely um, sure about uh, whatever happening in your, in your mind. This is what I usually tell to, to students that ask for me, that ask my, my opinion. Think about, if you are 100%, think more. You need to arrive at least a 300%. And in that moment, I can tell you, okay, these are the further steps. Yeah, thanks, Filippo. And I'll, I'll add to, um, I think that all of this is wonderful advice. And I feel like there are so many avenues to paleontology that may or may not involve certain levels of getting a PhD, a master's, um, and that if you find your tribe or your crew of people, you know, stick with them, support one another, um, network with people, have compassion for others because yeah, you know, the reality is it can be very difficult to find a job. It can be difficult to push through a school program. Um, but the more we support each other and find truly compassionate, folks in the field like that is rewriting you know science as being this stodgy thing that's off in a corner somewhere that doesn't care about the world so um, I think science communication is really important which is partially why we do all these kinds of talks so if you guys um, I know we're coming past to that well for me it's two o'clock uh, past the hour if you have other questions for Yara Filippo or myself please feel free to uh, pop them into the Facebook live chat. If you don't know where to find that, you can go to um, Facebook and search for paleontology education. It's where um, 
hopefully a bunch of you found us. Um, but if not, paleontology education, that's where you can find the continuation, the sequel, part episode five or whatever it might be. Oh, episode five. That's my favorite. <laughs> um, we've got a comment here and it just says, thanks for this. Uh, my first venture into such a presentation. I'm a retired nurse and recognize some of the pathology. Very cool. Um, and yeah, very interesting hour. So a lot of agreement in here on, on you know, really, really uh, the importance of having these kinds of conversations. Um, <laughs> a lot of thank yous are in the chat. Thanks for <laughs> um, so to be mindful of everyone's time, I just want to just give a huge thank you again to Yara and Filippo. Thank you for taking the time to do this and sharing your expert expertise. It's, it's, it, I'm just immensely grateful. And <laughs> um, may the F equals MA or force be with you. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, feel free to chime in questions in the Paleo Education Facebook group. Thank you, Yara and Filippo again so much. You're welcome. Thanks for the invitation, that was awesome. Yeah, have a great afternoon, evening, whatever time zone it might be for you. <laughs> evening. Take, take care out there, everyone. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Ciao.